Hi, Eric Johnson here at Owens Graduate School of Management, and I'm here today with John Byrne. John is the CEO and founder of Sea Change Media, uh, best known for poets and quants. Uh, and John has this amazing distinction of being the creator of the Business Week School Ranking. Back Don't in blame me for that. Late 80s, <laughs> late 80s. 1988 was the first regularly published of all the MBA rankings yeah. before US News, long before the Financial Times and others. Yeah. yeah. And then amazing stints at, at Business Week as editor-in-chief of businessweek.com and uh, other editorial roles there. Also uh, at Fast Company. Indeed, editor-in-chief of Fast Company. All that before starting Poets and Quants, which has now become really the go-to place for uh, business school students thinking about graduate school. So, uh, indeed, thank you. Exciting, exciting, exciting career. It's been fun. Well, I wanted to think back in time because you know when we talk about that business school ranking, I can remember, and you probably remember well, those articles already in the early '90s uh, proclaiming the death of the MBA. Sure. And uh, 25 years later, uh, the MBA is still the highest ROI graduate program on campus. Still the most popular graduate program in higher education. What do you make of all that? And, uh, I think that the ROI is uh, demonstrated. The satisfaction with the degree is extremely high. Uh, I think it's a lot easier to do an MBA than a master's in computer science, <laughs> which makes it more accessible to greater numbers of people. Uh, and there are industries that are completely closed off to people without an MBA. And increasingly for senior positions in companies, no matter where they are, oftentimes in the specs will be called uh, for an MBA. And along with those trends, the Students themselves, MBA students, are changing, looking for more diverse careers, maybe not following what might have been traditional eye banking or consulting paths. Is that good for the MBA? Yeah, totally, because I think what's happened is, uh, despite all the talk about the end of two-year programs, I think the MBA has become an all-purpose degree, and you see people who are venturing into all kinds of fields getting an MBA, including social enterprise, including government work, um, and things that we would not have ordinarily thought an MBA might be best suited for. Yeah. yeah. And that's changed dramatically. Yeah. Well, I'm the dean of a, of a relatively small school here Indeed. at Vanderbilt and uh, graduate focused, um, something we take great pride in, our kind of personal scale approach. But what advice would you have for me? Oh, boy. That's hard, Eric. You know this better than me. <laughs> I would say there, there are a few big trends right now. Um, I think one of the biggest trends is experiential learning. Mm -hmm. You know, increasingly people are thinking of a business education the way that uh, medicine is taught. And there is a clinical component to it. Mm -hmm. And while most MBA programs have had some sort of project work, which may end in a presentation, we're, I think you see schools moving to a much more uh, deeper involvement uh, in multiple projects over a two-year period for the MBA. And that's, uh, I think, a really good idea because once you get the fundamentals out of the way, the best place to integrate all that discipline-based knowledge is in a project where you have to bring finance, marketing, accounting, strategy to bear in one place. So that's one, one thing. Uh, uh, and of course, what that does is get students and faculty closer to real business yeah. uh, and result in uh, more employment opportunities. It sort of opens you, uh, the, an MBA's eyes to what life might be like in a mid-sized or smaller company as opposed to the big uh, companies. And we know that there's m far more interest today than ever before uh, in jobs uh, with companies we had never even heard of. <laughs> Um, so the old, you know, McKinsey, Bain, BCG, Goldman, Morgan, J.P. Morgan, uh, you B2C, know, yeah. it's, 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 that's, it, it's harder for them actually right. to get, get the people that sure. they want because sure. of this. The other thing that's occurred, as you well know, is this incredible rise in entrepreneurship. And it's not that MBAs are significantly uh, going out and starting companies from scratch, um, but it's that they think they want to do that after they get some, get a really good job, sure. pay, uh, off some debt. Keep, keep, pay, us, pay off some debt, 
keep that job for three to five years, uh, see how it goes, and then maybe want to go off and do their own thing. Uh, and even if they don't want to go and do their own thing, established uh, large companies want people with entrepreneurial mindsets. So there's been this explosion in entrepreneurship at, at most business schools. And that has involved uh, more clinical professors. That has involved more work in uh, early stage companies. And that has involved oftentimes um, seeding of student ventures. Because what, you, what we all uh, see is actually in the first three years um, that you get out of school, an extremely high percentage of MBAs have their own companies. Mm -hmm. They may be fully employed somewhere else, but on the side, yeah. they're working on something yeah, yeah. or they've already launched something with others. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the basic rates of entrepreneurship out of an MBA program is like only 5%. Uh, but if you look at it three years yeah. after, it's 15, 20%. And 5, 10, 15 yeah, and years Even down higher the road. and much yeah. higher. Yeah. Exactly. So that's, that's another big and important area. Um, and obviously for you, uh, healthcare is a really big and important uh, business and industry. Uh, Nashville is a center for the healthcare ecosystem. Uh, it's a massive part of our economy, and it's part of our economy that uh, traditionally has, has basically employed very few MBAs. Yeah. And I think that that is an incredible opportunity um, because with a $3.3 trillion um, industry that we have, it has amorphous and difficult to define as it actually is. Yeah. The opportunity there is immense, and the fact that Owen is at the center of it uh, is a major opportunity. So if you want advice, I, which you don't need from me for sure, um, I think it's to, it's to more fully leverage that. Mm -hmm. Of course, then the danger is you become known as the healthcare school, which you don't want, right? Mm -hmm. It's like Kellogg. Uh, it's great that they're known for marketing, but they don't want to be known for marketing. And Wharton is known for finance, but it doesn't want to be known for finance because uh, it does so much more than that, yeah. and, and just as Owen does. Yeah. Um, but healthcare has become so big and so underappreciated to recognize as an industry of opportunity for MBA graduates that I think there's so much upside there. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have 300, 350 companies in healthcare. That's crazy. Uh, in Nashville, and growing, alone, yeah, and growing, and it just and one company is spawning another one, and another one, and another one, um, and obviously, this is an industry that's ripe for disruption and change, uh, no matter what the government involvement in it might be. Um, so, and, and you have all the the executives, the expertise, the hospital. Uh, everything to possibly take advantage of this, which you already are. But I'm wondering, how, you know, how do we, how do you get to the next level yep. on healthcare, yep. and how do you, how do you sell it? How do you, how do you make it apparent not only to uh, potential people here, but um, to the general population of uh, people interested in management education that this is sort of the next frontier. Great advice. Thought provoking. Well, you know, I have a lot of executives come through, and one exactly. question I ask all of them is uh, to share a leadership lesson, something you've learned along the way that uh, you want to pass along to others. No, this that's simple. Okay, you want the most at bats you can get, because the more at bats you get, the more hits you can get. Now you might strike out uh, <laughs> more often as well, but it's key to make as many decisions as quickly as you can and agonize very little over them even when you're not comfortable with them, because I think when you, when you get to a certain age and you've seen a lot of experiences and you, and, and you basically have absorbed those experiences, mm -hmm. you kind of have to go with decisions even when you don't have all the data in yeah. front of you. Yeah. And, the, and the quicker you are uh, able to do that, the more successful I, I believe you'll actually be. So raise your hand, get out there. Totally, don't, don't be holding off. Don't postpone things that you know you can act on. Uh, and you could always pivot later on, usually on any, almost any decision, unless it's a big investment decision that's different. Um, but try to make as many decisions as quickly as possible 
uh, to increase your effectiveness at your job. That's great. Well, John, thanks for spending the day with us at Vanderbilt. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Really. Thank you, Eric, and good luck.